Thank you, Eric. And, uh, it, yeah, it's good to be here. I've been to Madison just once before 2006 and uh, for a local democracy convention, which actually helped start Curtis J. Budgeting in Chicago and then across the U.S. So it's nice to come full circle and, and uh, back here. So uh, again, my name is Josh Lerner, and I'll be talking about my book, Making Democracy Fun. But first, I just wanted to go around and do some quick intros. And everyone could just say their, their name and their favorite game, either to play or to watch. Uh, any volunteers to start? It's your name and your favorite game to play or to watch. Hi, my name is Claire. My favorite game to play is soccer. My name is Aisha, and my favorite game is um, Tetris. <laughs> Great. I have a treat for you, then. <laughs> um, my name is Jim, and um, uh, football. Oh, okay. American football or soccer? American. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and my favorite game to play is soccer. Also. My name is Matt, and we have baseball. Good afternoon. I suppose cross-country skiing isn't a game. <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in the games to play, I, you know, to you've invented a bunch of games. Yeah, but they're not fun to play. <laughs> <laughs> they're fun to, they're fun to, you know, sort of fuck with people's heads with. <laughs> I have a series of perverted chess rules that I play with people who are much better chess players than I am because it completely throws them off. Okay. Okay. Um, to, to have these tweaks of, of the rules. Uh, I suppose the my favorite game to watch on television is for the U.S. football fight. <laughs> Unadorned football. Um, to play, I like to play uh, um, the card game, Oak, that comes under various names, but Oak Hell is one of them. I, my name is Patrick, and by far my favorite game is football, both to play and watch a little bit playing for My name is Madeline, or Maddie, and I'll be patriotic and go, my favorite game is being nipple, so I don't know how many people know what nipple is, but I'll be to wonder about that. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Eric, and to watch, I'm a guilty American football fan, and to play tennis. Uh, I'm Jake, um, I guess to pick one, uh, I really like playing uh, double solitaire with my grandma. Mm -hmm. Card game, where you play solitaire. Nice. So, uh, a couple of quick questions. So, uh, how many of you have played or watched a game in the past week? Any kind of playing, watching on TV, watching live? Where do you want to tie someone to? Okay. I'll have to run How many folks here have been to a community meeting in the past week? <coughs> Go. As a researcher. No, that's fine. That counts like somewhat, I guess. So you, usually that difference is even more stark. But what I want to talk about is basically why why do more people play games than go to meetings that affect their lives? So it's somewhat um, uh, odd that these games that have no direct impact in our lives we spend so much more time on than community meetings, uh, political processes, public events that actually shape the the way our cities, our neighborhoods um, look, and how we can live in them. And what can we learn from what we play? so much more games and watch more games than we do participate. And this is probably, this is much more true than for folks outside of this room. So this is probably an unrepresented example. This is definitely an unrepresented example of, of the US. Uh, so think about your, your aunts and some uncles and cousins who are probably even more towards that spectrum of um, more games and less politics. So uh, I'll be talking about the book. And, uh, the way I'd like to do that is basically a tall story. So the book is very much story-based and try and tell <coughs> stories and then use them to illustrate broader points that we can use for a lot of our work. And so I'll be telling a story about a program in Rosario, Argentina, which Eric mentioned, a uh, participatory planning program that was so successful that, that after its first round of public meetings, the residents chased staff out of the neighborhood and staffed them. And so I'm going to talk about what that stabbing taught me about how to make democracy fun. And there's a good lesson there, actually. We'll find out. Uh, but before going into that, so I, many of you may have heard about participatory budgeting, which Eric mentioned. And I have some postcards here, which 
books and pass around if you want more information about that too. Besides writing the book, I'm also the executive director of the Participatory Budgeting Project, so we're a national nonprofit that works across the country and also in Canada to set up public processes in which people decide together how to spend public money. So people come together, brainstorm ideas for how they'd like to see money spent in their neighborhood, turn them into projects, put them on a ballot, and vote to decide how to spend their money. Before doing that, I basically went to public meetings for a living. So like Maddie, <laughs> I would go to meetings, sometimes as a participant, sometimes as a researcher, and try to, to see what was working and what wasn't working. So it's kind of like we're doing restaurants. So if you show up, you see if people are having a good time, if the staff are attentive, if what's on the menu is interesting, if there's good lighting, music, uh, if people are sticking around, uh, you know, how people are enjoying the experience. Uh, except the problem being that for, for meetings, the standard is pretty low. So for most meetings, the standard is, is there a meeting? So it's like if you enter a restaurant, and the standard was, is there food? Like, and if there's food, great, it's a good restaurant. So for meetings, we often accept that if there is a meeting, that we can check it off in the calendar. We have to do that, by law, maybe. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what happens as much as it took place. For a lot of folks that I work with, and probably for some of you in this room, that's, that's pretty frustrating. So we go to lots of really bad meetings, and there's lots of bad meetings that we don't even make it to because we know they're bad. So I thought there had to be a better way. So I, I set off on a, on a quest of sorts uh, in a couple directions to try to find a way to make that better. One was to Latin America, where I'd been doing some work before and been to some, some programs that were really active, and engaging, and inspiring. People seemed to be having a good time, lingering, talking with their friends. I wanted to find out why was it that these programs were engaging people in such a different way than what I'd experienced in, in the US. The other direction I set off on is at game design, looking at some games. I have a couple of good friends who are game designers, and I was really impressed by how much thought they and other game designers put into designing meaningful experiences and how little uh, such thinking planners, organizers, activists put into structuring experiences along those same lines. So I wanted to see what we could learn from those game designers to how to make meaningful experiences. So uh, as my two-year-old son would say, I went off on an explore down to, to Latin America and also to Canada. And one of the places that I did some work was in Rosario, Argentina, which I mentioned here. So the map of Argentina, Rosario, it's around a million people. It's on, on the river, it's old, uh, industrial, shipping town, very active social movements, progressive government. Uh, so picture kind of the San Francisco of Argentina, uh, but without the Google buses and with a lot more stake, so it's a bit different. The city there, has uh, been doing a lot of interesting pretty story programs, part of what brought Eric down as well. And one of them dealt with the shanty towns. So in Argentina, like a lot of Latin American countries, there are shanty towns interspersed uh, amongst the neighborhoods throughout the city. In Argentina, they're called uh, Villas Miserias. Yep. Um, they usually lack basic infrastructure, so no paved roads no electricity, no sewage systems, no uh, safe access to running water, um, pretty dangerous areas, a lot of gang activity, high unemployment. When it rains, these paths just become a, a muddy river with pools of glistening sewage on the side. Uh, not a great place to work. These are just in the middle of the city. The shacks, people's homes made of scavenged materials. Uh, people don't own their land, have any legal status there. So the city of Rosario wanted to change this and turn these, these shanty towns into regular neighborhoods. So they launched a program called Rosario Habitat, <coughs> which tried to, to uh, build up the basic infrastructure in these neighborhoods. You can see this map here. So the, this area is the shanty town. Uh, you can see these little tiny irregular shapes, those are lots where people live. And the city wanted to put in new streets so that they could install basic infrastructure. It's really hard to bring water, running water uh, to people if you can't actually get in with the street. And so they had to put in streets first so they could install sewage systems, electricity, water, and all of that. And turn them into uh, blocks that look more like forms, <coughs> regular houses. 
so the question is how to do that. These are very difficult areas to work in. And they, they started out by presenting a plan basically like this and saying, hey, what we're going to do is install new streets. This will let us bring in this basic infrastructure that we need. It will improve your quality of life. And the residents were pretty excited about it. And they organized a bunch of meetings. The residents came out. And they said, sounds good. They even literally signed on the plan. So they had these plans <coughs> and the signature on them. Then a few months later, it came time to build these new roads. And the construction crews came in and told the families that they have to start relocating. Because if you see here, to build a road here, certain families have to move. It's on top of houses now. So the staff came in and explained that they'd be moving to their new houses. They actually would get new houses as part of the program. And the residents said no. We're, we're not moving. And they started arguing back and forth. The residents refused to move. And that's when they chased the staff out and, and stabbed them. <coughs> uh, so we're sorry, we said, OK, we have to rethink this. It's not working. Let's start over. And they redesigned the program. And that's what I'd like to, to talk about is what they did differently and how that changed the dynamics in a very uh, deep and powerful way. So what they started is they brought people together, and this time they, they began with the, with the game. So they brought folks into the room, this big uh, community center in one of the, next to one of the city towns. And they divide people up into tables, so small groups of around uh, five to 10 people. And the facilitators from Lucia put a bag on each table and asked the residents <coughs> to empty it out. And there are a bunch of puzzle pieces uh, in the bag, uh, typical neighborhood scenes for the shanty towns, so like a pile of trash or like rabbit cats uh, crawling around it. And Lucia said, okay, each group try to put together the puzzle without talking. So the residents moved the pieces around, tried to put them together, and they couldn't, they were getting frustrated. So Lucia said, okay, uh, round two, now you can talk to each other. They started talking in their groups, to put, uh, they still couldn't get the puzzle to fit. So she said, okay, now round three, you can talk with the other groups. Which wasn't actually against the rules. No one had just no one had thought of it because they were at their tables. So suddenly they, they started to get up and look at the other tables and realized that each table had a missing piece from the other puzzles. And so they very quickly collected the missing pieces and each table was able to put their puzzle pieces together. And they, they got it pretty quickly. And Lucy asked, what was the point of this? Why are we doing this game at the start of a workshop to redesign your neighborhood? And folks, you know, they said, if we, we have to work together, if we're going to do this, it's about the whole community, it's not about just my one piece. Um, that we don't have open, if we don't have open communication, we're not going to be able to solve the neighborhood's problems. And they started working together much more as a team. They come into the room very individual, and already they started to get them working together as a team. <coughs> the next step was to write the rules of the process. So there were, there were some fixed rules of the program. that actually are pretty good things, almost guarantees as much as rules. So for example, if you had to move from the block, you would get a new house. Uh, that uh, the new houses, both on the blocks, uh, on the city towns and elsewhere, would be at least 90 meters squared, the land size. So you'd have basic uh, living space, which wasn't always the case beforehand. It's a lot more very small. So things like that, there were as much kind of guarantees of a basic quality of life as anything else, but there were also rules. And then they wanted to set rules for deciding basically who would move and who would stay and, and who would go. So recognizing that there's limited land and people weren't all going to fit where they were, especially with the new infrastructure. So how were they going to so decide who would move and who would stay? So the staff asked the residents to pick rules for deciding that. Uh, so they started brainstorming a list of criteria. So for example, if someone had a job nearby, or if they grew up in that, in that house, or if they <coughs> had a disability, or if they were a single parent. Things that could make it easier or harder for them to relocate. And then they asked the residents to, to vote, to rank order those rules. So you can see here, the residents going up and casting their votes for the different rules and deciding which ones were top priority. And they ended up with a rank list that said, OK, in a situation where there's two people for one spot of land, here's how we will together decide who will stay and who will go. The next step, which is uh, harder, is then basically mapping out uh, the block. And so I'm glad you mentioned Tetris as your favorite game, because <laughs> they basically adapted Tetris to uh, planning. 
and they have uh, maps of each block. And then these color transparency cutouts, each of which represents a lot of land. Those 90 meter square lots of land. And different rectangles, L's, squares. And they ask the residents to put them together, to put the pieces together to figure out where the different lots would go and who would stay and who would go. And so you can see there's some of the, the residents moving the pieces around. This is done over a few, a few months, actually, several workshops where they would do different iterations, trying to put them in this way, couldn't quite get it, they'd come back after having talked it over more. <coughs> and, um, and the goal was to come up with a full map of the block, with each person's house represented by one of these blocks, one of those uh, transparency cutouts. And so it, it was you know, very engaging, people were getting some hands-on experience, figuring out where they would go. It was still pretty rough in the shanty town, and so the, the violence I mentioned before still carrying over, and actually a couple, a couple of the, um, the staff had been robbed at gunpoint in their office by residents in the past couple weeks. So residents had come into the office, held a, held a gun to the staff's head, <laughs> and robbed them. Uh, so they had to cancel the last workshops or postpone them because of the, the violence, and when we did go in for the, the last workshop to um, lay out the lots, what they called Loteo, to be accompanied by some of the municipal guards to go in there. So, you know, as productive as it was, it's still a very difficult environment. So this last workshop where they're trying to put together the, the pieces, uh, it's almost done. I see this, this guy, this big buff guy Mario, sitting there just staring at the map intently at this one spot of it. And he has a ski cap on, just looks really frustrated, and suddenly he heals out and points at the this one spot in the map, and you can see he's pointing, there's even a skull tattoo on his hand, he's pointing out the, it's like, that, that road is on top of my house that my dad built with his bare hands 27 years ago. You want me to move because of some stupid road? And he's screaming, he's dead serious, uh, and he's like, no one knows what's gonna happen. I look at the staff, they look at each other nervously. I start to inch towards the door a bit, not really sure what's gonna happen. And he's, not backing down, and that's when the most amazing thing happened, which is one of his neighbors then stepped in and said, whoa, 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 the only reason that you're moving is because of the rules we agreed on. That we need to have the space for the road so we can get our water and our sewage systems and electricity, and you're actually getting a new house that you'll have title to in a better neighborhood. Uh, other folks chimed in, emphasizing that they've been building up this up for weeks, it was the whole community effort, it wasn't just about him. He was still angry, uh, and he said to the staff, go talk to the planning department and see if you can move this road. Uh, but if you can't, I'll go. So he wasn't happy with the decision, but he recognized that it was necessary for the greater good of the whole community, and they arrived at a final plan for the block. So you can see this is the way it looked once they laid out all of their pieces. Each one of these is a lot of land, decent size that they'll have ownership over, uh, and some folks who won't fit anymore who will get new houses elsewhere in the city, putting those pieces together. And so at the very end of the process, you see a dramatic transformation. So this is the before picture, and this is after. Paved streets, electricity, new houses, nothing fancy, but pretty, but decent housing. Uh, new health centers, school built nearby, huge transformation in people's living conditions. So on one hand, I think this is a story just about that amazing transformation, which in itself is, is fantastic that they managed to take this violent, incredibly difficult situation and work with the residents to have a uh, transform the urban setting and people's quality of life. For me though, what's really interesting is what we can learn about this for all the other kinds of policy making and planning and organizing processes that folks are engaged in. So what I want to do is take a step back now, actually, and look at what happens here, and try to see what were the dynamics that made this work, and what are the broader lessons that we can learn. And there's three main things that I want to point to. Uh, the, the first just big conclusion from this work that I found is that uh, using games and game design can make democracy not just fun, but actually make it work. So these processes weren't just more enjoyable, they also were much more effective. 
So it's not just a trivial thing where we're mixing the game and we have a good time, but actually to resolve the deepest challenges of democracy, this was immensely effective. And it wasn't just about having a nice bigger game, those are good, but actually redesigning the whole process. So some folks hear about the book and they go, oh, it's about how to, how to use games, and, or how to have a game in a meeting. And it's really not actually. It's about how to redesign democracy, and how to learn the lessons from game design to change how we experience democratic processes and, and government and governance. So they, they restructured the whole process, they redesigned the whole process like a game, using game mechanics, uh, which I'll go over some of those in a minute. The second big lesson for me, though, was that this didn't always work, actually. I talked about one of the good stories, but I also went to some, some workshops and some other programs where uh, there were people who felt that they were manipulated, or that it was a trivial experience, or that actually it wasn't fun, even though they were trying to make it more engaging. Uh, usually that wasn't the case, but I wouldn't want folks to walk away thinking that games are a universal solution for all of our problems in democracy. They, like any other kinds of process, can, uh, can work better and worse, and sometimes they didn't work as well. So I don't want to be kind of too idealistic about this. The, the third thing that, that I learned is that game design is really an art, and it's not just um, adding some points to something or adding a icebreaker game and sprinkle it in like MSG and hoping that everything tastes better. But there's a lot of thought that goes into it and that what designers do is they create uh, structures built on a variety of game mechanics. So you're kind of building up this machine um, and those game mechanics are the, the, kind of, um, the, the gears that make that work. And so, for example, the, the three main things I found, the three main and categories of those mechanics that, that worked. So one was having really clear, legitimate rules. So if you think about any game, it starts with rules, you, what you can do and what you can't do. And soccer is a great example, actually, where uh, the rules shape the game, and also, in a sense, they, they limit what you can do. So if you think about soccer, if your goal was to just get the ball from one end of the field into their goal, the best way to do that would just be to pick it up and run towards the goal. But you can't do that it's against the rules. So you have to take a very inefficient way of getting the ball to the other end of the field by kicking it. That rule, which limits what you can do, is what makes, makes soccer interesting. So if you didn't have that rule, then it'd be a, well, either a pretty boring game or it'd be rugby, I guess, depending on your conception of rugby. Uh, but we think of rules often as something we don't want too many rules. But rules can actually generate a lot of creative action by forcing us to think of new ways to get things done within limitations. So in this process, they have rules, they have limitations. There's only so much that you can do on a certain plot of land. Uh, if you want to have basic infrastructure, you have to have access. You have to have um, basically be able to get in. So there's a lot of things that limited what they could do. It wasn't just a, a blank slate for them to play with. But that also inspired a lot of creativity for folks and got them to believe in the process, where they saw it as their own, as opposed to something they just signed off on that someone else had done for them. The second thing that, that games do, there's kind of categories of game mechanics, is they create artificial conflict. So in any kind of game, there's a conflict, a competition, whether it's between players, between groups, between a player and a system. Solitaire is a great example of that, where you're competing against the system. There's a limited number of cards, and you as an individual are trying to, to beat that out. And there's a lot of different structures for, for game conflict. So that what the, this process used is a group versus system where there's a group of people competing against the systemic constraints. So the system is this plot of land, there's only so much of it, and what can the group uh, manage to fit in given that, that uh, systemic constraint? And what that does is it focuses what was before either an individual against individual conflict or an individual against the city conflict, and has folks focused on working together instead. And you can see their attention focuses <coughs> towards this team challenge and one nice thing that this did too is it, it created what designers would call a, a magic circle. So a magic circle is this space that you enter into when you play a game within which special rules apply. So again, you think about soccer. Once you enter into the confines of the field, the rules apply. When you're outside of it, they don't. And you agree to accept those rules once you enter the space. And that's where um, the, the game play begins. And so you can see here, they basically created a board. 
and that focused people's attention <coughs> on the game pieces and on the, 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 the uh, shapes as opposed to each other. So whereas before it was this neighbor versus that neighbor trying to figure out where they would live, now it's this rectangle versus that rectangle. And how are we going to make those fit together? Um, so it diffused a lot of the conflict, which is inherent in any kind of situation with housing, for example, in that space. The third uh, core feature of games is measurable outcomes. So you think of any game, you win, you lose, there's points, there's a tie. Uh, without that, uh, there's not the motivation to play uh, a lot of times, and it's unclear um, how the game will end up. They made it very clear what the outcomes would be. So after going through the process, and they put posters up like this in the workshops after they've been through a first iteration, after going through this, you will win basically a whole new neighborhood. Uh, all these new conditions of um, the affect your day to day life. And so making that super clear and, and literally visible in the space, so people, when they're at the meeting, could see why they were there. You know, why bother showing up? Why, why come to this extra meeting? This is why. So the, um, the process did, I think, a really impressive job integrating those different game mechanics, and there's a lot more that I talk about too. Uh, in a way that redesigned how people were making decisions about about housing and about land. And what, um, so I, so I look, I look at that, I look at some of their programs in Rosario and in Canada as well, and draw out from that these key both games and game mechanics that we can use for designing any kind of political community process to make it more engaging and to make it more fun. And I really think to make it work effectively and to address that challenge that I put out at the beginning of, of too many meetings. So uh, if we're having engaging, active, enjoyable experiences, it's not too many meetings. It's actually a key part of our life. So that's that's the, the ultimate vision, the real utopia that I would like to see this put up to is where we enjoy going to a meeting to decide something about our community as much as we would enjoy watching a game on TV. And I think that's totally doable if we set our sights on it. So that's the book. session and they hammer out the things there and they come out and vote on them and, and uh, very few people are happy about that sort of thing. Um, I'll share some information with you later but I don't want to yeah. skew this discussion away from yours. And, and there's certainly ways to integrate representation into this and so some of the processes I looked at also have forms of representation but yeah I think it's right what you say whenever there is that interaction whether it's between people in the community whether it's between representatives how to make that I, I haven't read the book. I'm sure there's a great deal more detail there. But I didn't, I missed the game. The, I see that they're rearranging things and that they're, that's interactive and maybe it looks kind of like a game. It doesn't sound, and I, I, I don't know, I only heard what you said about it. It, doesn't, it didn't sound like it would look a game in the way that I'm used to a game. Maybe it is, and I just didn't see. Is game a metaphor for the kind of meetings that should take place, or is game literally what should be part of the no, that's a great question. So on one hand, the, they did use a game, and I talked to the puzzle game that I talked about where you have to complete a puzzle, it's a kind of puzzle challenge. That was one example of a game, and I talked about some others in my book, and I think those are useful, and those are already 
being used in a lot of organizations and government processes, whether it be an icebreaker game or a team building game or a capacity building game. And those are good. Uh, and there's a lot of ways we can make more use of those. But right for me, that's, that's only one part of it. And it's not so much games as metaphor, it's game design. So designing processes using the principles and the tools of game design. So metaphor is really just looking at a situation through a certain lens. So I'm talking about is designing that, that, that process. And so I wouldn't say that the, or sorry, Habitat, the, um, the workshops, no, I, actually I don't think it's a game. I think it's a process that is designed like a game using the principles of game design and therefore is very effective. And the, the main difference really there is that, uh, I mean, you could argue this is a game. I, I don't really think it's necessary. But the conflict, it's partly artificial, but it also is, is very real uh, in a sense and does transcend this space more than, say, for soccer. Uh, but it's made more artificial through this. So it's not that it's not, it's not a real conflict, but this helps to diffuse it and make it more artificial. And for me, it's really, though it's not, it's not so much a matter of saying, is this or is this not a game, but rather, how is this designed in a way that's more effective? And um, what kind of mechanics can we learn from an experience like this to more broadly apply that? Can I follow up on that? Sure. So it is at this point in the process, so for example, when we're trying to put the puzzle together, mm -hmm. are, they, are they getting, do they have a sense that we're having fun rather than only that we're, oh, I can see that we're devising a collaborative and practical solution to problems that are affecting us and we're motivated because we can see that there's going to be an outcome, there's going to be a win. But is it actually fun? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a great question too. So. Uh, the concept of fun is really tricky, and there actually there aren't a lot of good definitions of fun. Uh, I talk about that, and I talk about how other people have tried talking about it and often fail to really pin it down. I mean, if, if folks want to think actually about something that, that is fun, you know, uh, that you enjoy doing, and picture your face in that moment, you're probably not giggling and laughing. You probably have a really serious face, actually, and you're intensely focused. So fun. We often think of it as lying on a beach, reading a book, a kind of leisure activities, or very frivolous. But when people have, in the last studies that I've found, that, that when people are most enjoying themselves, they're actually intensely focused on accomplishing a difficult task. And if you think about games again, uh, when games are their most enjoyable, you're just at stretching the limits of what you're capable of, and pushing yourself really hard to accomplish something that you hadn't accomplished before. And uh, that same feeling applies to all kinds of contexts. So whether you're a surgeon operating someone and doing a very difficult surgery, uh, they have a lot of fun doing that as well, and it's really pushing their limits. Or if you're an organizer, organizing that a great uh, rally, and you are just right at, in your zone, that is fun. So part of what I want to do is dispel the notion that fun is trivial. Fun is, is when we're applying ourselves in a really meaningful way. So I wouldn't say that they were, if you asked them afterwards, would they say this is fun? I wouldn't necessarily say that. Are they very engaged and having a positive experience? Yes. Uh, and I think that's partly because we've, we've pigeonholed fun as this thing that's the opposite of work, and that's really not the case. The uh, fun is deeply linked to productive work as well. Is it the, I'm sorry, to add just one more. Yeah. Is it the case that the, the game, if you will, most analogous to most of these situations is doing puzzles. I mean, uh, that, that it's a matter of reconciling conflicting um, objectives, trying to find out the best fit, and that kind of thing. It really depends on what the, what the issue is and what the decision is. So, um, yeah, the, these, this experience happened to involve a couple of puzzle challenges, but the other ones I look at um, don't necessarily. But some kind of uh, systemic context for the game, I found was present in a lot of these just because they're tackling big picture issues. So some of the processes I looked at use theater games, theater of the oppressed, where they're acting out scenarios of oppression and then trying to creatively invent uh, solutions to them. A game between actors and spec actors, as they're called in that. Uh, others involve producer budgeting, which I look at. Um, so it's interesting though, I think the point, what, what's good about a puzzle is that you do have very clear limits and, and the, the systemic kind of the structure surrounding that is very present. 
but I don't think it has to involve necessarily a puzzle. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, and maybe at the risk of playing the metaphor and overplaying my game here at hand, um, how do games and the design of the games possibly set up people with different sets of skills or uh, different backgrounds to kind of have an edge? I mean, I'm thinking like if you've never played Halo before and you go into like some online multiplayer thing, you know, you're gonna be killed instantly because these people, you know, they play Halo all, Halo all day. And, um, or, uh, or other games where, you know, maybe there's a small glitch that if you know the system, you're able to kind of exploit that and, and, and play the game better than others. And so how to deal with kind of inequalities that may come from the skill of playing a similar game a lot or from knowing some sort of little glitch that yeah, so there's, I guess, a couple of different issues there, but the latter one that you mentioned is kind of gaming the game or gaming the system, which there's a lot of, with, uh, uh, that happens a lot in games, happens a lot in life as well. <laughs> and then the other question, I mean, it's, it's complicated, but part of it, I think, is people's different skill levels and how to engage people across the skill levels in the common process is part of it. One, one thing that I think made a lot of these processes work and the music side thing about games is that they actually are more accessible than most means of communication. So they're a more popular form of communication interaction than we're used to. So picture this with them sitting around a room in chairs debating how to allocate land. How accessible is that? <laughs> so inherently what games do is they, they make any kind of process and game design techniques as well more accessible for average people because most people interact using games or play more than using rational deliberation or participatory democratic processes. <laughs> uh, not that there's a necessarily a distinction between the two, but uh, what this is it made the process more accessible. I think the games and, and game design and uh, game mechanics could be really effective at that. Uh, but also building in different skill levels, so that could be having uh, at different sessions for beginners or um, even some handicaps, which are often used in games, so if it's your first time, you get some extra support. Uh, but also even just recognizing that people learn by playing. So a lot of these, a lot of these games are new, too. I mean, people haven't sat down and, and done this before. So usually the process is, when this is introduced, it's a new experience for everyone. They may be able to draw on, on other experiences. I suppose folks who have played Tetris a lot have a slight advantage here. But uh, really, it's, it's not a huge advantage when they get down to it. So as long as people have that opportunity to learn by playing, and there's a space for that, which, which is true for any kind of game, you don't start out in a game at level seven, you start out at level one, which is usually pretty easy, and teaches you how to play, and then you level up from there. So that's a really effective way of doing it. That. As far as gaming the system, that did happen sometimes, and that's one of the challenges of this, but it's actually, I think, just a challenge of any kind of democratic process. It happens, I would argue, even more, <laughs> when it's not structured like a game and where the rules aren't transparent than it does in, in experiences like this. So you think about your typical public hearing or community meeting, it's already been gamed by people in the room that have the most power and the most influence, whether you know it or not. So at least this way, it's much more transparent and you, it's easier to then intervene and, and address some of that. But yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if, um, if you noticed any differences in terms of like game design um, because like this type of how you would build a session in like social justice education or um, we're focused more on like critical consciousness or community building and those types of circles this is sort of a methodology that's used a lot and so I'm wondering what differences there are when you connect it to sort of direct decision making in the community like is there anything in your work that you found that has to be adjusted to make it work for, you know, deciding where the houses will go. If, if I can just add sure. to that, in the community building, consciousness raising, educational contexts, people don't expect that kind of event to be efficient. That is, they expect the process of that sort of meeting to be one which is experiential. And it can be boring if it's a lecture, or exciting if it's still all this stuff. Whereas if you go to a problem-solving, task-oriented thing, there is a, a trade-off then between the efficiency of the meeting 
And I imagine, for example, if theater of the oppressed scenarios are brought to a problem-solving thing, people who are already pretty sophisticated might get pretty impatient with that because they feel, I've been there, done that. I already have that kind of understanding. I want to just get down to business. And for some people, just getting down to business is itself very engaging. You know, that, that is, putting your mind to work to solve the problem is what makes it interesting. And all this stuff might just seem like you know, sort of fluffing around and wasting time, making the meeting twice as long as it would otherwise have to be. Uh, so, a couple thousands of good questions. <coughs> for the latter one, one of the real lessons for me from this work was uh, focusing on, on user-centric user design, so designing the experience for the user, which is what game designers do, where they're not designing an abstract game, they're thinking of particular people who are going to be playing it, and designing it around those people, and around often the very diverse people who play a game, so um, there isn't just one player type. Most games are built to accommodate diverse players, so there's uh, typologies of game players, so there's uh, people who are called killers who want to go in and just kill a bunch of people. <laughs> uh, there's people who want to, uh, uh, who are social, who go in and actually just want to hang out with people and talk and engage socially in games. There's folks who are uh, achievers who aim to rack up the most points and uh, other categories like that, where if you look at closely at the game, you'll see all those different types of people with different experiences, different goals, interacting, and games build in spaces for all of them to have meaningful experiences. So, so you can wander around just killing people if you want, or you can wander around talking to people, uh, or you can try and rack up the most points. It's actually very difficult to balance a lot of those. But a key point is just recognizing who's, who is this for, and what are they coming in with, and what, what skills do they have, and what skills don't they have. And one of the games actually that I designed, uh, in one chapter of the book, I talk about how I tried to apply some of the lessons learned to an actual process, and, and it's very challenging for myself as well. I, get, I designed a, a, a matching game for a participatory research process, where the participants were trying to match up research indicators with things they would see in the field. So, um, for example, um, yeah, turnout at an event, and who you're counting on. <coughs> Do you count uh, staff? Do you count participants? Do you count researchers? Like, what are you looking for in the space when you're trying to find a, 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 a trying to measure an indicator? I designed it have these pieces that are uh, laid out on the table before matching them up, and I totally overestimated the preparedness of the people in the room. So it was much harder than I thought. <laughs> and what I designed as a, a 20 minute game ended up taking them over an hour. So I think it's really critical to recognize the skill level, the differences between that, uh, whether everyone is going to be able to engage with this meaningfully or some folks are going to get bored of it very quickly. And if so, there's ways to build in different uh, challenges for them. So like in that game, some of the matches were harder than others. So folks who were very new to research could focus on some of the easier ones. Folks who have more experience could tackle some of the bigger challenges. But yeah, that's definitely, a, definitely an issue. I mean, you saw some folks here who were having a lot of trouble with it, other folks who helped coach them. And there's a big role for mentorship in games. Uh, and then to go back to the other point of how to uh, connect this with real decisions when you're in, in actual political processes or organizing processes. Um, I mean, again, I, for me, so much of it comes back to those three core elements of games, like the clear rules, artificial conflict, and measurable outcomes which I feel like are often lacking from a lot of our processes. And um, part of the conflict especially is that we tend to think of conflict or competition as bad. That we want collaborative processes. And competition is often stigmatized in social justice circles, which I think is unfortunate because competition can be immensely collaborative. And it's a really false dichotomy. So again, thinking about soccer. Soccer is a, immense, is a very competitive and very collaborative sport. <laughs> that you have two teams competing against each other. But players collaborating very closely on each team because of that competition. If you took away the other team, they wouldn't be working together as tightly. And competition, I think we can infuse that in some more of our processes. In participatory budgeting, it's a big element. People are competing to get a pot of money. And it's real. And there's a lot at stake. And people are pushing for their projects. And that's what adds a lot of energy to the process. It gets people excited about it. 
and then the outcomes. Like we really often don't do a good job of saying you know, for what. Why why should someone come out to this meeting? What how is it going to change their life? How are they going to benefit from it? What are they going to get out of it? Um, we often assume they want to participate because we want to participate, and because we care about the issue, they should care about it. So making it much more visible, what people will get if they come out. So in for display budgeting, we say, come out to a meeting to decide how to spend a million dollars. So a million dollars is on the table. Come out. Uh, so people can see if they come out, they have all this money, and they can get concrete things for their neighborhood. So I think there's a lot more we could do with that. Right. My question actually, Lisa, and I think it connects also with Jake's question. Um, and you've actually just started to answer it a little, actually. I was <laughs> going to ask about um, the competitiveness and how competition is um, a really major factor of what drives people's um, engagement with sport in particular, and how competition can be, I think, it, had, it can be good. And I was going to ask you whether or not you think, you know, to what extent it can be good, but then you sort of to answer that, but I'm also thinking about how it can be bad in soccer is a really good example when you think about um, riots and so on between supporters. But another thing about competition, I think, is that um, competition can be something that attracts particular people to take part, but it can also um, it can also deter from taking part. So I know, at least in sport, a lot of people who they like to sort of participate in, say, training as I'll, I'll use cycling. They like to they like to train as a cyclist and ride their bikes in a sort of nice. Um, sort of social kind of way, but they don't want to actually take part in the race or be sort of competitors in terms of racing. Um, so I think that I'm wondering what you think about how to integrate competition in a way that, I mean, you can take competition pretty far in terms of how it divides people, but also how it then engages people. So yeah, how do you <coughs> balance the, the degree of competitiveness? So one of the game mechanics that I found in a lot of experiences I looked at that was really effective was this group versus system dynamic, where a group of people are competing against the constraints of a system. And um, that way there, there isn't competition between people in the space or participants, but it still drives people forward. So it kind of has the best of that competition, of the driving force of competition, without the some animosity <laughs> uh, against the side. So, uh, Predictor budgeting, I think, works in that way a lot. Uh, this experience did in, in Rosario. So thinking about how you can make very clear the opposition there, and, and again, a lot of social justice organizing does this to some degree, where you're talking about the system and work and we're working to change it. But you can make that a lot clearer, I think, as well, uh, if you focus on a particular problem, like what are the systemic constraints that we're up against um, for a particular decision, for a particular issue, and. How are we going to recognize those and overcome them? Uh, and that, that framing can be really powerful for driving people forward. Uh, the other thing, though, that reminded me of, and this may have been into one of the other questions before, but a lot of folks, when I do these activities or, or games, people's default is not wanting to engage with them. Because we're used to walking into a room and sitting down and listening. And that's our default, unfortunately, that's our default for engaging in a lot of community processes or political processes. So for anyone especially who wants to do anything like this, I would say um, don't let that stop you. <coughs> that assume people will not want to get up and move and participate actively and play a game. And that after they do, they'll be glad they did. Every time that I've done uh, an activity like this, people are glad afterwards and feel that it's better afterwards. And every time, they're reluctant to start. <laughs> so it, it takes some, some perseverance and some faith that it actually will be effective and people will, will enjoy themselves and feel as a more meaningful experience afterwards. And not balking too much at people not wanting to compete, not wanting to uh, to get up out of their seats and move. Uh, so every time, again, I, I found that it is effective in the end if it's designed well. But yeah, that's one thing I noticed for sure. And some facilitators, when they met that initial resistance, they backed down and didn't follow through, and often those were Really awesome workshops, actually. Yeah. So in some of these, where there'd be facilitators who just didn't follow through with it, and so you had this half-hearted attempt to to do this, and uh, where there weren't clear rules, people didn't really know what they're doing. We have these pieces out here on a board, but what, what are we doing here? And it was a big flop. <laughs> in this area, there was obviously a lot of money being put in by the community, and so yeah. for the residents, it was win-win if they could stop stabbing the staff and let them go forward, right? And we're going to have, in participatory budgeting, I don't know much really about that, but 
are they just given a pool of money to divide? And I can see with now with all the restraints on uh, the financial world that you know if there's an upcoming need and they'll be taking money from some other established program. So there's that kind of conflict. And I'm wondering also as participatory um, budgeting, do they just start and say, here's a, a pool of money that you have? Or does it actually get into how much, how big that pool should be, the tax, that taxing side of things? Have you seen, have you used it where the, the group gets together to decide how much should we tax these people to create this budget and then how we're going to divide this also? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for participatory budgeting, what usually works is there is a certain pot of money that there's discretionary funds or part of a budget that's um, designated for the process and people brainstorm ideas decide how to spend the money. So there is a certain portion of the budget that can be expanded and often does expand over time. What's interesting though about your question is something else that I found that that um, participatory budgeting and, and a lot of these processes that are built uh, like games, news games, are really good at provoking questions. So getting people to question the system and question what they can and can't do. So in Rosario Habitat, people started out being able to decide where they would go, where their houses would go on this map, and they started asking, well, what about the new places we've moved to, and where are they located, and why are they located there? And they um, got to see the changed locations of those new housing. Then when they saw what it would look like, they said, whoa, we don't like these floor plans. <laughs> um, they, they designed a new producer process to, to change the floor plans. Uh, another one for building a new plaza. So they started to see this is a new way that we can actually work together to decide issues, and they injected that into a lot of other spaces. So it didn't start with that, but it provoked questions about what else we could decide on, what else we can engage with in a more meaningful way. And I've seen the same in participatory budgeting, where people don't start out deciding on taxation, but they end up asking a lot of questions about, say, about procurement. Why do things cost this much? And um, about revenue. You know, why do we only have this much money in the cloud? What other revenue raising means are there? And ultimately, we've had some discussions about doing participatory budgeting with revenue. I think that would be very exciting. And uh, the, the, these experiences are often a starting point for getting folks to tackle those questions and push the envelope of what they can do. A couple more of you and then wrap up the Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's totally persuasive to me that you can't just simply create a game that's, uh, you know, one size fits all, but rather that you need to be attentive to specific challenges and needs or whatever of the community. So. That says to me then that people are likely to need to have access to these game designers. Um, and so I'm wondering what kinds of possibilities there are there, but also limitations. So that, I mean, are there game designers who are actually making themselves available to communities, or, I mean, across the planet, and saying, we're here doing this, please avail yourselves of our you know, abilities. And I mean, that probably comes with a price. So, I'm wondering about all that practical side of it. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so there is a whole social issue games or games for change movement of designers, most of whom do really digital design and, and, and video games or online games. But designing games for change, for raising awareness about social issues, for engaging people in them. And I, I talk a, a lot about that work in one of the chapters in the book. Uh, they sometimes collaborate with organizations and movements Usually, not so much. Usually, it's more they design a game and hope that it gets out there in the world. <coughs> so I think that, that detachment is actually somewhat problematic. And there's a lot more money in these games that they're designing than in a lot of the organizing groups and processes that are working on the ground. Uh, but there are folks out there who who can and have worked uh, with grassroots groups and local programs to design effective games. I don't think you necessarily need a game designer, though, to, um, to at least improve the design of programs and, and meetings and processes. And so what I try to do in the book is really make it so that your average organizer or planner can learn some of those lessons and apply it without having to go to an expert, without having to pay an expert. There's still certainly value in having those folks on board, but there's also a lot of expertise in social movements already. So a lot of the programs I talk about, there's great game designers working in theater of the arrest. Like, they're not recognized as game designers by the game design industry, but they design some great games too. So uh, I don't think you have to be an officially sanctioned expert for that. 
which gets to another point too about, about technology, which is another thing that I find often comes up. And there's most of that industry is very tech heavy, so designing games that are uh, either paid online or um, uh, cell phones. And that can be great, but I really don't think that's necessary either. The, what I found is that it's more about good design than about the tech tools that are applied to that. And this is how game designers work too. If you're learning game design, in like game design 101 classes, usually one of the things they do first is they ask you to turn off the computer and take out paper and design a card game <laughs> or a board game using paper and not focus on what the avatars look like and coloring in the clouds and putting all your effort into making it look pretty, but focusing on the actual structure of the game and the game mechanics. Because too often designers, and a lot of us, focus on those aesthetic details which can matter, but at the expense of the structure of the experience. And the best games are not your games because they have pretty icons in them. They're games because they have really compelling structures and they're really carefully designed. So that's one thing I would encourage too, is just thinking about that structure and then thinking about if or how technology can be helpful for that, and not just jumping to the conclusion that it has to be a tech heavy game. You know, this, the, the materials they used here, this costs nothing actually. It's funny, they, they ended up using these transparency cutouts because they had to move offices uh, at one point. And so they're in this old office building, and it's the day before the workshop, and they're looking for materials to use for their next workshop, and they were going through these old filing cabinets and found a, a drawer full of old reports and the covers were these transparencies. And so they just tore off the covers from all the reports and cut them up and used those for the workshop. It cost nothing, and it was immensely effective. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot that we can do without game designers as well. Um, Joshua just had a question about how far you think the game metaphor can be extended. So, um, looking at how this unfolded, I'm wondering about the extent to which some boundaries were set around the kinds of conversations, um, just in the process of setting, you know, making rules, establishing rules, the extent to which that constrained um, the kinds of issues that people could raise, and also the extent to which they could think about challenging the broader structures of inequality in which these, you know, processes are taking place. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, and uh, I mean, on one hand, as I mentioned before, sometimes those rules were set and those boundaries set, and then they were expanded. And I think that even though there were those limitations at first, people then were inspired to push uh, against them. But also there were times programs that, that I looked at where um, those limitations fell arbitrary, and where people were frustrated that why are we talking about this instead of that? And um, where the, the power of the designer was too great, and felt that people were being kind of moved along like puppets. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's really challenging. You'll see that in some video games or other games too, where some of them feel uh, really roads where you're just going through the actions and that your options are really limited. The, the one way around that that some of the game designers I respect the most say is that game design shouldn't be about designing experiences, it should be about designing structures for experience. So when you get into designing what someone does, that's when it feels limiting. When you design a space that enables them, to have new experiences that enables them to make meaningful choices. That's what's empowering about games. And so not focusing on how this person is going to move in the space or how they're going to toss the ball or whatever, but uh, creating that, that structure, that system that enables people to have experiences and have meaningful choices. And so that that's, I think, part of the, the framework and the groundwork for empowerment is having meaningful choices, which requires laying out some conditions, requires laying out some different options. Uh, but not dictating what people will, what route people will take, uh, and leaving open that space for them to take new routes that you haven't even envisioned. So that, that's where the experiences can be really, really empowering. But it's super challenging. And actually, um, the thing that Dr. Patrick was mentioning, it, these are designed for different contexts, different kinds of people. Um, it's really important to use an iterative design process. So try something out, see how it works, and then change it, and then try it again, then change it, and then try it again. Like, designers don't just sit down and spend a weekend designing a game. They'll do a draft version, try it, realize a ton of mistakes, <laughs> and then change them, and keep doing that through several iterations. And sometimes I forget this, and I'll design a game that I think is just great, you will know, talk it through with someone, and then I'll 
I've tested it out, or I'll, I'll do it for the first time and realize some incredibly obvious thing that I just hadn't thought of that you're not going to see until you actually do it. So that's one of the best ways to design for particular people in particular spaces is test it and see how it works. So you're not you know, taking advantage of the existence of people who are, because they have a social justice commitment, willing to help you out. You do need to have people within your community who are committed to really seriously sitting down and thinking through it in terms of designing a structure that will allow for these kinds of experiences. I mean, if you're not, it's not going to work as well, it sounds like. I mean, you have to have your own people committed to designing the process. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I, well, add to that, then I'll, <laughs> I have just another thought that around this cluster. Yeah, I mean, you do to, to an extent, I mean, hopefully you already have that, so let, I mean, if you're an organization, the folks in your organization who are working on your campaign should already be thinking about those issues, and if not, then, then it's a good space to engage them. But it does take work, too, and I, I wouldn't want to underestimate that. That's one of the challenges that I face personally in trying to actually follow the lessons I lay out in the book is that it, it takes a lot of investment up front. And I think that the payoff is really big afterwards that you have much more effective processes, but you have to put in that planning time to, to design it well. And if you don't, then yeah, it's not going to work. So a lot of it is about that longer term planning. If, if I set up an effective structure now, it'll save me time in the long run. And recognizing that time you're saving in the long run, it makes it worthwhile investing it now. But yeah. You have to have a group of people who are committed to design. Because most people do do what you said I had described at the beginning. They just continue to do the same sorts of meetings that are not effective because people are bored and don't feel empowered. So. Yeah, inertia is powerful. So I'm still puzzling about the contrast between a context where efficiency is actually of considerable value versus ones which are not. So when you're playing a video game, it's going to go on for years and you some of these open platform things. You're not thinking about how quickly can I finish the game because it's all the in-process enjoyment of doing it. Um, similarly, when you go, you know, when you uh, go to a weekend retreat that's going to be social justice education, you know it's going to come to an end, but the the question is how meaningful and productive are all the things you're doing, not how efficiently are you getting done with them. So efficiency is really on the sidelines. It's not that it has no relevance, but it isn't pressing in on you. Whereas in political meetings where you're actually trying to accomplish things and come to decisions, it's always the case that there's efficiency constraints that are working in. And in that context, the game metaphor, I'm not sure. You certainly want there to be activities, there to be engaging things that people do. You don't want it to be boring, and all that's true. But to say that we want these meetings to be game-like, even as a metaphor, it's not, I understand the design principles, but the game metaphor seems actually a little bit of a di digression from what you're really trying to do. Um, and I would think game designers actually might be really bad at <laughs> thinking about how do we design a two-hour event which will be really efficient in getting things done. You know, that's not <laughs> as well as engaging. So, uh, so I mean, breakouts are a good example. You know, I usually find breakouts a waste of time, not always, but in that meetings. It just seems to be a, a diversion between getting down and doing it. Not always. And a lot has to do with the extent to which there are specific problems to be solved in a breakout as opposed to it just being a chance for people to talk to each other because then they talk to each other and they report back and then everybody it you know doesn't always do it. But I don't think of a breakout session as a game. You know, that I don't think that would be the way people, even when it's done well, would say anyway that, so I'm, I, there is just this tension when if you think about when efficiency really matters to people. Or just to take another example, there are times when a uh, when people self-organize into a production process to get a newsletter out, where they adopt tailorist divisions of labor, and they have a station where you're doing the stapling, rather, and a station where you're 
you know, people want to organize it as brutally efficient as possible, they just want to get it done. They don't want that part, they don't worry about whether that part of the process is fun. They want that part of the process to be as short as possible. Mm -hmm. And Taylorism is not a bad way. A hyper division of labor, you might rotate your jobs occasionally so you don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. That's a separate matter. But the actual task divisions get pretty, get pretty fine grades. And part of that goes to why I chose this name for the book. So it's, it's called Making Democracy Fun not making life fun, even though I think life should be fun as well. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that we should apply this to every single thing that we do. There are lots of contexts where, where uh, I wouldn't design it like a game. And if you're having a kind of scoping session, I think sometimes it's really valuable just to have a discussion and not have it be structured in this way. What, for me, the, the, the challenge that I want to tackle on this is when we do have to reach a decision, when we do have to decide or want to decide something democratically as a group makes a decision about our community or about our collective welfare, and how can we do that more effectively? So I actually, I would maybe kind of flip your, your analysis on that and said a bit where I, I would say games are more useful for those times when you have to reach a decision and you're um, very focused on that than for the times when you're having a brainstorming and visioning group session or something like that. Um, that, that games and game design can be very effective, I think, usually is very effective in some well for reaching those decisions. Because usually we do that very ineffectively, actually. And people walk away either not having decided something, having not agreed to what was decided, uh, being frustrated, frustrated with it. And that games and game design, I think, can make that process more meaningful for people and more, more effective. So uh, yeah, I, I often find them much better able to tackle those time-constrained challenges of reaching a decision than having a less structured, less user-centric uh, process. But yeah, I wouldn't want to say this is for every, every moment of your life. <laughs> and there's people who write about that too, about you know, the gamification of our lives, and, and there's a very sinister side to that as well. But more just when we do have to make decisions, when we want to make decisions, how can we do that more effectively? So I think there's a lot of tools that can help with that. Oh, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> and I have a few copies of the books here.